We are delighted to have such a good turnout. Uh, today is the first of two sessions to talk about the wonderful financial crisis. Those of you who had me in class have heard different initials than the wonderful financial crisis, but we'll leave it at that in this esteemed group. Um, what we're going to do today is really uh, talk more about how we got here and really dig a little deeper. What I put up on the screen was one of many resources uh, that you can take a look at if you want to be able to carry on a cocktail conversation about what's going on in the finance world. Don't think we need to sort of deal with the cocktail conversation stuff right now because you guys have been reading the news, I hope. Uh, if you're going to go into a general management job and somebody wants you to summarize in a couple sentences what's going on, you know, this particular site is something from the New York Times and see those little blue bars? Each of those goes into detail about each of the uh, significant events over the last six weeks and their links to New York Times stories. I don't have a particular bias. Well, I do have a particular bias to New York Times, but it's organized very well. So you guys can see these kind of things. We'll put up uh, these kind of links on a website. Really what we're going to do today is dig into a lot more detail uh, about what's been going on. So today is going to be more, uh, if you will, lecture uh, oriented. And then next week we'll follow up with more a discussion about how do we get ourselves out of this mess. But the first thing was today talk about how we got into this mess. Just so we can gauge the audience uh, correctly, because there are a lot of different folks here, just by show of hands, how many of you are first year MBAs? How many of you are second year MBAs? How many of you are in the Masters of Finance program? Masters of OR supply chain? Uh, masters of accountancy? Undergrads? Other? Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> PhDs, um, JD, MBA, Ted. Who else? Who else is is here from other groups? Esteemed mem members of the faculty and administration. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm leaving out. So it's a fairly mixed group. So some of you probably could be up here and be giving half of this talk. Others probably don't know half of the vocabulary. So it's a very mixed audience. And despite the fact that we have a bunch of faculty up here and a bunch of slides, use this as an opportunity to ask questions, even if they seem like silly questions. Guarantee you, those of you who are going to, uh, to look for jobs, and I, I, I assume that's most of you, are going to be asked to try to make sense of what's going on with this crisis. So great opportunity uh, to learn. Before I hand it over to Peter Richkin, who is going to go through most of the slides today, um, let's just very quickly introduce the members of the faculty that are here. I'm Scott Fine. Um, I'm a professor in the Banking and Finance Department focus primarily on investment banking uh, and valuation. Peter? I'm Peter Richkin. I'm chair of the finance department, and my area of specialty is in derivatives and risk management. Hi, I'm Justin Sidnor. I'm an assistant professor in the economics department. And you, might, uh, you guys might uh, mention what areas you focus on. And I'm David Klingingsmith, also in economics, and I work on uh, developing countries. Nicolas Atera from economics as well, uh, working on incentives in organizations. Uh, Leonardo Moderator, Bank and Finance, and uh, research based on corporate finance and investment bank as well. Uh, Robin Dubin, Department of Economics. Uh, my research is on housing and spatial econometrics. Matt Sobel, Department of Operations. My area is on the interface of operations management and finance. My name is Krista Bauman. I'm in the BAFI department, and my research and also teaching focuses on commercial banking and corporate finance. OK, well, let's uh, give a round of applause if we can to everybody who's taking time out of their day. <laughs> and again, even though this is a large group, and it looks like a formal presentation, please raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll come out and address your questions. Don't, don't be afraid to interrupt Peter, OK? Right? That's right. All right. Oh, no. <laughs> Take it away, Peter. Yeah, we advertised this as a round table, but this is just the first part. We're going to have the round table, actually, in our next session. So what I pr uh, propose doing is going through a couple of hundred overheads uh, in the next hour or so with you. And uh, feel free to interrupt uh, my, my, my colleagues here. I will be more than delighted to answer all the questions uh, that you have. 
So this is called the subprime banking crisis. I don't know if it's going to go down as a subprime banking crisis or whether it will get uh, some name. But uh, it really starts off with the American dream, which is, uh, you know, to own a nice, modest home. <laughs> uh, and usually that comes with a, a servant's quarters, a tennis courts, a swimming pool. In this case, we got a pond. And uh, right now, probably we're a little bit underwater. Uh, here's a saying. It's, it's called, uh, don't panic. And this was put out by, uh, that's the panicked cry, actually, of governments and central bankers around the world right now. So to put this in, in context, uh, you know, how big is this crisis? Uh, in, in, nine, in 2007 dollars, uh, if you look at some of the previous uh, crises, the U.S. Uh, savings and loan crisis was, in today's dollars, $200 billion dollars. The Japan's banking crisis, which went on for about a decade, was 600 billion. Here's the Asian banking crisis. And here we are with uh, the, the losses of banks so far, banks and financial institutions, at uh, you know, over a trillion dollars and probably growing. A lot of the overheads that I put together I haven't fully cited, and a lot of them uh, come from, a lot of the statistics come from the Global Financial Stability Report. So if you Google that, you can see this report. It's about a, I don't know, two, three hundred page report, and it's a very, very thorough report about what's going on in today's markets. I strongly recommend that as a resource. So the idea is we're going to look at the, uh, the whole market, all the players in it. And this goes from the homeowners at the front end, you know, through the mortgage brokers, the, invest the banks who do the underwriting and securitization. We're going to look at this market. We're going to look at, the, the, at this market very carefully, the supply side of of it, and then we're going to turn attention to the demand side as well. We're going to look carefully at the shadow banking system, how banks get involved, how investment banks get involved. We're going to look at the commercial paper market, and we're going to see how Wall Street meets Main Street, and, the, and how everything is connected. And then we'll look at all the agencies around it, whether they be hedge funds, You can't hear me? That's unusual. <laughs> okay, we're going to look at all the participants around it. Uh, the increasing role of sovereign wealth funds, the increasing role of hedge funds, the role of regulators, etc. And the idea is to set up a platform, to look through this entire supply chain and set up a platform so that we can ask intelligent questions about how we should move forward from where we are today. That's, that's the game plan. So it turns out it's a 13-act drama, and that's how I've set it up. <laughs> Uh, the first we're going to look at the, at the demand side, which is really caused by home ownership, by leverage, and by the unbelievable appetite for cons our consumers to spend money. Uh, we'll then look at the firm side, and we'll see firms have become very leveraged as well. And uh, so that will be the demand side. There's an insatiable appetite for mortgage-backed securities. We'll look at that. We'll look at the shadow banking system and money markets. And then we'll look at the credit default swap market and see how cre credit derivatives plays a big role in what's happened. And then we'll sort of walk through some of the things that have happened. Not all of them, but some of the key things that have happened. Uh, and the implications for these things in terms of the changing nature of banking, and t the acts that the Federal Reserve has done, what's happened with Fannie and Freddie, the role of the government, and we'll look at global markets as well and see the impact of global markets, what's happening there. And that will lead us to our next round table, which will really, we'll look at the bailout plan in more detail.
and look at regulation, pointing fingers, and see what, what really should come out of all of this. So that, that's the game plan. So we'll start off with Act 1, which is our home ownership. And to do that, to know where we are today, I think it's really important to go back in time and look at history. And when you go back to the savings and loan crisis uh, over a decade ago, you know, prior to the 1980s, uh, savings and loans uh, basically funded 30-year fixed rate mortgages with short maturity deposits. And so there's a, there's a duration mit, mismatch between the assets the banks held and the way they funded them. They're basically playing the yield curve. And uh, this, this caused a lot of problems. There are some big losses that came out of it. And the conclusion at that time, and it's the correct conclusion, was that long term, that lending long term and borrowing short term is not really going to work. We've got to change the savings and loan system. So regulators got together and then essentially encouraged banks to sell fixed rate mortgages that they originated. So rather than hold them and fund them at the short rate, they told them, let's sell your mortgages. And regulators encourage banks to make adjustable rate mortgages. So there's a move away from fixed rate mortgages. And so this was going to pass interest rate risk on to homeowners. So this seemed at that time an intelligent thing to do. And so what happened is uh, banks, uh, savings and loans, would pool their, their, their mortgages together and then sell them. And so this way, they'd sell them to a much larger group of investors, all around the world, perhaps. And so mortgage risk would be shared, and this would uh, release more capital for banks to make more mortgages. And so this is what's called the originate and distribute model. And whenever you go to this type of model, you introduce two types of problems. The first type of problem is called adverse selection. This is where banks may sell their worst loans. And the second one is moral hazard, that banks have less of an incentive to do the screening. They're going to just sell these securities anyway. And the third issue was that homeowners have more interest rate risk. They're bearing a lot of interest rate risk now. Anyway, to facilitate all of this, the government got involved, right? And they, they basically set up Fannie and Freddie. And the mission was to improve ownership of low and middle in income uh, families. And that was their first mission. Their second objective was to create liquid securities based on pools of mortgages that would, be low, would not have any credit risk. So they created Freddie and Fannie. And uh, these agencies absolutely guaranteed that the interest and in principal would be paid. Not necessarily the timing of the cash flows, but they eliminated all forms of credit risk. So they fully backed the, these, the, the bonds that they would issue. And by purchasing the mortgages, they provided banks and other financial institutions with fresh money to make new loans. So this was all very, very sensible. And it was very successful, unbelievably successful. Uh, in no time at all, they controlled about 75% of all uh, mortgage sec security pass-throughs. And they owned or guaranteed about half of the $12 trillion mortgage market. Can you, can you explain what a pass-through is? So pass-through security is you're going to pull all these uh, uh, mortgages together and these mortgages are going to be your assets. They're going to give you some cash flows, which come in the form of principal payments, interest payments. And of course, if you have a mortgage, you can always prepay. So those cash flows are passed through to people who buy these types of securities. So they're called asset-backed securities. I'll have a lot more to say about them a little later. So by 2000, uh, this is towards the end of the Clinton administration, the Treasury debt at that time was, was declining quite dramatically. There were less Treasury securities being issued, and there was a need for new benchmarks. 
And these agency issues were thought to be the new benchmark securities. And at that time, they were trading at about 50 basis points over Treasury. They're sort of implicitly backed by the United States government. They're very, very safe securities. What you're saying is the yield is about a half percent above the equivalent maturity track. Correct. Okay. Correct. 50 basis point spread means that they were trading. You got an extra half of 1% uh, return on this investment over a completely riskless security. In fact, uh, Alan Greenspan indicated that he expected the private sector capital markets would create benchmarks to replace Treasury securities. In fact, a lot of pension funds were mandated to hold Treasury bonds in their portfolio. And at that time, the deficit was shrinking so quickly that they thought that maybe there wouldn't be a need to have Treasury securities. In fact, the Fed approved mortgage-based securities of government-sponsored agencies as collateral uh, for this important repo market, which um, I don't think we need to go into at this stage. But it's, it, they're just viewed as very safe securities. How big was this market? Well, the vertical axis here is in trillions of dollars. And you can see the gray values are the, what the agencies issued. So they did the majority of, of these mortgage-backed securities. Private labels contributed a small part to it. And then you have your Alt-A and your subprime. We all know what subprime is. Uh, Alt-A is somewhere between prime and subprime. Okay? And you can see the actual subprime market, which is this yellow, it was growing, but it's still a very small part of the entire market. So the very small part. Doing any subprime What's that? The agencies. The agencies initially weren't doing any subprime, right. but in recent times they started taking on some subprime uh, strategies. And the other important thing is this is new issuance per year. So this is new issuance you take per year. Correct. Correct. So if you look at the entire size of the U.S. bond market, uh, taking into account the debt issued to fund uh, activities, the agencies contributed about one quarter of the $31 trillion market. And so they, they're a very powerful force uh, in this, very important actors in this game. Okay, so a summary for Chapter 1, you have uh, the government making it a, a, you know, important to get, uh, to get homeowners or potential homeowners into homes and helping, helping that out. They help it out in two ways. They create tax deductions on mortgage interest payments and they actually create these government-sponsored entities, Freddie and Fannie. Okay, and Freddie and Fannie issue these securities called mortgage-backed securities and the rating agencies actually get involved and they rate them. So they put their certification stamp on them. And that's a very important thing to think about is the role of certification in all of this because, you know, when you go out and you buy a, a, a second-hand Lexus, you don't look under the hood. What you generally do is look at the certification that backs it. So these mortgage-backed securities are relatively complex products, but if they rate a triple A, then that certification is going to be a very powerful signal to markets. Okay, so we've got homeowners that are, that are, that are led into houses. Subprime loans means that there's probably more people buying into houses and being leveraged up than what should have been the case. So now I want to talk a little bit about consumer spending and home prices. Here's the Case-Shiller Index, and you can see that over the last decade, home prices have been going up dramatically, reaching a, a peak around June 06. And the idea was that home prices wouldn't ever fall dramatically. They may stay flat, but they wouldn't, sell, they wouldn't drop dramatically. Uh, this is in contrast to the stock market where we saw during the dot-com bubble stock prices did drop quite dramatically, uh, came up and of course now they, they back down. 
So what are consumers doing? They, they, they're buying plasma screen TVs, they're buying like crazy, and they're borrowing and they leverage up to here. They're in big doo-doo. <laughs> and here's a, an example. It's, this is the ratio of household debt to gross disposable income. And you can see in the United States, this ratio is very high. It's over 100%, 140% compared to, say, France, where it's 60%. So there's lots of leverage going on here. At the same time, you see that standards probably are starting to, to, to go downhill. What you see in this picture is the proportion of late of delinquencies, 60 day plus delinquencies on cohorts of mortgages. And you can see generally that the rate is very high, you know, in the 20%, 20% of all mortgages of subprime mortgages are going bad. And this was recognized some years ago, in 2003, 2004. We knew this was happening. And not only did we continue issuing sub, uh, 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 subprime debt, but you can see the, the, the standards deteriorated further. In fact, the cohort of 2007 is off to a really, really bad start. But it's not only in the subprime, the subprime area that things have gone bad. It's gone bad in the Alt-A area. The default rates have been increasing. And even prime mortgages. You can see in this figure that, uh, that the, the prime rate mortgages, we still got a 1.5% default rate on that. Prices in the, of, of these mortgages have come tumbling down in recent times. Uh, to give you an example, some of the really bad rated stuff, instead of being priced at 100, have tumbled to basically nothing. So what's happened in very recent times is we've got tightening lending standards that are set up. Makes it harder for people to refinance. Uh, people anticipate that overall in the mortgage market, we're going to have a 2% uh, default rate uh, in 2009. Uh, this pressure on household balance sheets has caused a deterioration on consumer loans. People can't get home equity loans, so they start running up their credit card. And um, uh, we're going to see uh, a lot of problems in the credit card market. I mean, this country only has 300 million people, 300 million plus people, and yet there's over 3 billion credit card applications sent out every year. I mean, it just, it just blows my mind, right? Uh, weaker consumers are lead, uh, will lead to, weakening, uh, 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 to credit weakening in commercial real estate. And the commercial real estate market hasn't been hit so far yet but it's going to get uh, a, lot, a lot more worse. Then. So the bottom line is we see that consumers up to here are in doo-doo, and uh, this is really not, not a healthy sign for the future. We now turn to what's happened with firms. And we'll see that firms have become very highly leveraged. And why is this the case? First of all, as most of you know, especially those of you taking BAFI 403, that there's a massive tax advantage of debt. And so when you look at the capital structure of firms, increasingly they've levered themselves up. There's an advantage to debt. If you lower the cost of bankruptcy, you increase the likelihood that firms will borrow more money. Here are six firms. Does anyone know what these six firms have in common? <coughs> They're the only six firms in the United States that are rated AAA. <laughs> There's only six non-financial firms that are rated AAA. It's been a clear objective of firms. The cost of being rated AAA is too high that firms have lost their AAA status intentionally by taking on more debt. At the same time, the Federal Reserve the policy has been to maintain negative rail rates. I've just uh, finished up a study with Joe Halbrick at the Federal Reserve Bank and um, George Panacci at University of Illinois, 
And here is a time series that we've extracted from uh, Treasury inflation protection securities and Treasury bonds and inflation forecasts. And what we've, what we've extracted is the real rates, real interest rates. And you see that real interest rates from 2001 to about 2005 were actually negative. And these negative real rates have really fueled a cheap uh, credit boom. Peter, what's the difference between the real rate and the nominal rate? So the real rate, uh, people, the nominal rate is the total rate of return that you get. But the basket of goods that it can buy changes over time. And so this is the, r the real rate is the actual cost of that basket of goods over time. So it's, it's adjusted for inflation. So it's adjusted downward for inflation. Okay, the last thing is the role of private equity and leverage buyouts. They've come in and they have uh, been buying firms and leveraging them up. And there's a whole theory of finance just to say why this is a good thing. And again, you'll, I'm sure you'll learn about this in Baffy 403. But you put all of these things together and what do you have? You have firms up to here in Dudu. You have consumers up to here in Dudu. And even our government has been borrowed, borrowing very heavily. And on top of that, Wall Street is very highly leveraged. Let's see what uh, our banks have been doing. And you can see for this figure that our banks have become increasingly more leveraged. So this makes our whole system a lot more fragile. If just one thing goes wrong, it can definitely uh, increase systemic risk and cause problems in, in our economy. So Peter, you might comment on that, you know, the, the firms that are at about 33 times leverage. How much equity do they have? What does that imply? 3%? And what does it imply? 3% three, three, three equity. 3% equity, yeah. Go ahead and repeat it. I just said, you know, that this chart says that the leverage ratio is at 33 for some of these firms. Flip that, do the reciprocal of that. What that implies is the amount of equity is 3%, the amount of debt is 97% in these firms. So these firms were very, very clever. Not a lot of buffer for things going wrong. Okay, so that's the supply, that's the, uh, supply side. Let's look at the demand side because this is really, I think, quite interesting. And so we've got a whole bunch of hedge funds. And all these plasma screens are being, uh, <laughs> are being bought by our homeowners, and that's ending up in sovereign wealth funds. All that money, together with all the, all the dollars going to pay for oil, are ending up in sovereign wealth funds that are looking for a place to park their money. We also have investment banks, we have pension funds, we have all kinds of funds who are looking for alternative investments. And all of this is happening when interest rates are really low. And so yield enhancement has become the name of the game. They're looking for alternative investments. And what better area than the mortgage-backed securities? These are de facto insured by the government because they're agency securities. So there's a, just a huge demand for these products. They're being mocked up by banks, including, say, Citigroup. And so Citigroup would be one typical bank that would be buying these things. They rate a triple A. They've got these wraps around them, which are guarantees provided by various insurance companies. And so they look like they're very, very safe securities. So what I want to talk about now is what's called the shadow banking system. And so what happens, some of these banks may set up what's called a SIV. And what a SIV is, is really an old-fashioned savings and loan. They're going to buy these mortgage-backed securities, and they're going to finance them by issuing things like short-term commercial paper. Okay, so they're going to, they're going to be just like an old-fashioned savings and loan. And they're going to be a standalone entity. Oftentimes, they set up by these banks to get rid of some of their stuff on their balance sheet. So they're buying them. 
and they're financing them by selling commercial paper. And commercial paper is also being sold by our financial, uh, by, by firms like Caterpillar, by Ford, by General Electric. They need short-term funds to make, to meet payroll. So com the way to think about commercial paper is just short-term debt issued by a firm. Usually it's 30 days long. Could be even shorter than 30 days. And it's unsecured. Their corporate IOUs, basically. Yeah. And so, so this commercial paper market is quite a big market. At the same time, the banking industry is going through s somewhat of a fundamental change where uh, LIBOR, the, which stands for London Interbank Offer Rate, banks borrow and lend each day from each other. So sometimes they need money, sometimes they have money to lend. They're lending from each other at this rate, LIBOR rate. This LIBOR index is sort of the benchmark for trillions of dollars of loans issued by various firms. It's a huge, important index. And this LIBOR index is coming under attack because of the changing role of banks. Why is that so? It's because there's this money market that's been set up. And these money funds are about a three, three to four trillion dollar market. And so a lot of people are putting money into money funds. And what a money fund is, a prime money fund, is they're looking for some form. It's meant to be riskless or almost riskless. And they're putting money into these funds, but they're looking for a little bit more return. So they may buy commercial paper, they may buy things that are a little bit risky, but not too risky. Okay, so what's, you know, so what they may buy is commercial paper from one of these SIPs. And that commercial paper is actually guaranteed, is backed by mortgage-backed securities. So in some sense, these, these money funds are buying securities backed by mortgages. And at the same time, the banking industry is increasingly dependent on this $3.5 trillion market. They're borrowing money overnight from this market rather than from each other. So LIBOR as a benchmark has become weaker and weaker. In fact, in the newspapers, there are reports about how LIBOR was being distorted a little bit. And how you set this LIBOR rate is critically important. So that's what's going on at this point in time. But there's an unbelievable demand for mortgage-backed securities driven by all of these players in this market. Okay, I couldn't quite hear you, but you want me to just give you an example. Yeah, okay. So, 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 so here we have, here we have a sieve, it needs short-term money. So it goes and gets that short-term money from a, a money fund, from prime reserve money fund, right? And they'll lend it to them overnight, or maybe for 30 days, or maybe 60 days if it was really a long-dated contract. And in return, they'd get some form of yield for it, which would be passed through to the people who invest in a money fund. But not only are they getting money from, not only are they investing in commercial paper here, they're also buying commercial paper from Ford. Okay, have I answered your question, Mahan? Okay, so here we are. We've got, we've got our demand being driven on this side. We've got, uh, sorry, our supply being driven on this side. We've got a low interest rate environment. And we've got just a huge demand for yield enhancement, which is basically coming from these mortgage-backed securities. So if anything goes wrong in this market here, it can have a filter effect through these serves into money funds. Okay, and that's a very important consideration because that's where the supply chain really gets disrupted. 
is these money funds are essentially investing in mortgage-backed securities. So in finance, there's a beautiful saying. It's when the ducks are quacking, feed them, feed them, feed them. And so that's what investment banks do. They, uh, if there's a lot of demand there, usually we say financial assets are all zero net present value projects, and there should be zero net present value projects. But in this circumstance, uh, if the ducks are quacking, maybe you can extract some return from them. But just to give you a sense of the market at this point in time, we see the subprime, subprime loan market as a small market. I mean, it's 300 billion. And what's a billion here and a billion there these days, right? <laughs> but it's a small market in comparison to the, to the rest of the credit markets. Uh, and here's, here's the rest of the credit markets. <coughs> and here is the securities, the derivatives and corporate securities. The asset-backed securities is about a trillion dollars. Uh, the CDOs, is about, which we'll talk about, is about a $400 billion market. Uh, the corporate bond market, the investment grade corporate bond market is about three trillion. This corporate bond market has grown massively uh, over the last decade. It was a very tiny market, but it's grown massively. Okay, so we've looked at the demand side a little bit and we've looked at the supply side. And when the ducks are quacking, feed them. And so let's see how Wall Street managed this. How are we doing on time? We're, we're fine. Yeah, you know, go, back, go back to the previous slide. Just Which previous slide? I'm sorry, there's actually two, two more to, to the back. You know, so one of the other things, you know, in terms of the next shoe to drop, you talked a little bit earlier about the high yield market and all these LBOs, which is really what where these, these high yield loans came from. This is a much bigger number than it certainly was 10, 20 uh, years ago. And so that's a whole other shoe to drop. Mm -hmm. you know, when things get get tight, a lot of the a lot of these LBOs are just not going to make it. Correct. Okay, so let's go to the next chapter. So there's a lot of private firms. In this case, they, they banks and mortgage or originators get into the act. National City Bank would be one of them, where they, they pull a whole bunch of mortgages and then sell them maybe to other companies, Country Bank being one of them, who would securitize them. And they don't go through the agencies. So these are called private labels. And starting in around 2000, private label mortgage-backed securities, uh, be, you know, increasingly issued pools of mortgages or claims on these mortgages which had no credit enhancements. So remember what I said about the, the, the mortgage-backed securities issued through Fannie and Freddie? that they were guaranteed, all credit risk was taken care of. All of a sudden, credit risk wasn't taken care of by these private labels. And that created a market for credit intermediation, where there was a need to lay off, to, de to, to design contracts that would lay off credit risk. So I think you know what a subprime mortgage is. I'm going to assume you do. But I want to just take you very briefly through the way that credit risk can be, can be managed. And also, I want to take you through a process where you can create liquidity out of illiquid securities. And so the idea is that you've got a, a bunch, a pool of mortgages created. And these pool of mortgages would be sold to a trust. So National City Bank, instead of keeping those mortgages on their books, would sell everything into a trust. Now, the trust would get its money from investors who would buy bonds. 
they would give money to this trust. And in return, they would get an IOU. And the way this would work is the first set of cash flows coming from these assets would go to the highest rated bonds, asset-backed securities bonds. This would be called the first tranche. And if there's something left over, it would go to the second tranche. And in the final tranche, there could be as many as 15 tranches, but the final tranche would be the equity tranche. This would clearly be the most risky, because if, if there were any defaults, anything happened, these people at the bottom wouldn't get any money. Okay, so the, the, the return, the yield on these bonds were very high to compensate for that risk. So all losses are first credited towards the bottom, and anything good that happens gets, gets, goes to the top. So this is called a waterfall process. Now, it's very easy to sell the top tranche because it's very likely that they will get cash flows. All the defaults are going to be charged to the bottom tranches. So this tranche is typically rated by an agency as triple A. And sometimes to get credit enhancement, you, these cash flows have to be guaranteed by some agency like perhaps MBIA or perhaps an AIG, someone like that. <laughs> these tranches over here, these junior tranches, are more risky and oftentimes they have to be held on the balance sheet. They can't sell them. And uh, this is sort of in some sense not good news because you'd like, if, you, if you're part of this trust, you'd like to, to leverage up a little bit. So you'd like to get these off your balance sheet. You'd like to be able to sell these. So what do you do? You repackage them. You repackage them. What you do is you get a whole bunch of these bad loans or the second tranche loans and you create a new security called a CDO. So you, and the CDO is just it's a separate standalone company that buys these illiquid securities. That becomes the assets. And then they issue claims against those assets which have a waterfall structure. And these are very difficult to value, these CDOs. If you look at the very first supercomputer, the Cray supercomputer, it was sold to Salomon Brothers. And Salomon Brothers actually used this supercomputer to value these uh, mortgage-backed securities. They're very complex securities. For those of you taking BAFI 431, you may dig a little bit deeper into how you value a CDO. But why stop there? Why stop there? Let's create more liquidity, more leverage. And so what we'll do is we'll take the, the junior parts of these tranches from a CDO and we'll do the same thing. And we'll call it a CDO squared. A CDO squared. Now if you want to trace where those cash flows are actually coming from, it's a very complicated activity. And so investors who own a claim on a CDO squared right now you know, they basically in a little bit of, uh, these CDO squares aren't trading very high. <laughs> uh, Peter, you may want to add, uh, one, one of the issues with the CDOs and CDO square, again, you'll have this, um, so Peter explained that when you have a mortgage-backed security, you, know, you have these different tranches with the best tranche being rated AAA, then double A, single A, triple B, etc. <laughs> but for a CDO and CDO square, you have something similar. Okay, so you take, for the CDO, you've taken, for example, a triple B piece, and again, you're slicing and dicing it, and again, you have a triple A piece, a double A piece. Ah, uh, beautiful. And for the CDO squared as well. So, but like Peter explained, um, right now, the lower rated tranches of the mortgage-backed securities, you know, they're not paying out in full because of all these defaults. So if you have a CDO or a CDO squared, even though you've invested maybe in the triple A tranche, there's just no money to pay you. Okay, so you think that you have you know, a very 
Yeah, thank you very much. That's really well put. And, you know, it sort of points fingers a little bit to the rating agencies, right? Why did the rating agencies rate these things AAA? That's one issue. And it also points fingers at uh, companies like AIG because what the ratings agency would often say is to have this tranche rated AAA, you need to get a wrapper around it, an insurance wrapper, which would guarantee the credit risk of those cash flows. And that would often be provided by companies like AIG. And when you think about an AIG, you know, when you think about an insurance company, they rely on the law of large numbers. That's traditionally what they do, right? Any insurance company, they pool risks, and these risks are all a little bit independent of each other. So the central limit theorem actually holds. So you can make, it becomes very easy to predict the overall aggregate cash flows. But this is a very, very different business because this, the law of large numbers will absolutely not hold in this case. What will happen is if prices drop dramatically, if home prices drop dramatically, there'll be a whole lot of correlated events. And so instead of the law of large numbers applying, you have to look at the distribution of possible losses. And so, uh, you know, AIG and companies like them were getting into a market we really had no prior experience in being. Question. Uh, on the previous slide, at the bottom, you had 48 CDO square. Are you using like No, that's just, that's just page CDO number 48. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it does get worse. It does get worse. Now, I, you know, I can assure you we're going to run out of time here, so um, I'm not quite sure how to proceed. But, it gets worse because what this figure shows is by 2006, the CDO market was massive. And this is the size of the market at different time points. So you can see in 2006, we have $900 billion worth of CDO issuance. But the majority of it, this green part here, is what I've really been talking about. This yellow part here is what's called an arbitrage CDO, or uh, it's often part of it is what's called a synthetic CDO. <laughs> so the question is, should I explain what a synthetic yes. CDO is? Yes. <laughs> okay, so we're definitely <laughs> going to run out of time if I explain what a synthetic CDO is, but it, it is kind of important. And it does relate to uh, the role of credit derivatives. I mean, uh, if any of you have taken my class, you know that I say there's no such thing as a bad credit. Uh, there's no such thing as a bad derivative. There's, it's like there's no such thing as a bad bullet. There's just a lot of bad users of derivatives. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look at the, uh, at, 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 at the derivatives market because this, this, is, this is a small, uh, an important part of the process. Um, Scott, what do you think I'd do here? Because we've got limited time. We have 45 minutes. I think we have 45 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Can you maybe just quickly recap for everybody, just so everybody's on the same page, the difference between the mortgage-backed securities and the CDOs? Just so sure. quickly as you go into this next section, make okay. sure everybody's on the same page with that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so you have mortgages, which are, which are at this end over here. They, uh, the homeowner owes the bank a certain amount of money. These mortgages are pooled and sold off to a trust. And they provide cash flows. That becomes the assets of the trust. And now you have claims written on them. And that's an asset-backed security. And these asset-backed securities are pooled, and you have claims written on them. And they're called CDOs. And then you have CDOs pooled, and you have claims written against them. And they're called CDO squares. Is that, is that what you had in mind? And then derivatives apply, <coughs> refers to? So we're getting to derivative. Yeah. These are all derivative products. They derive value based on homes, ultimately, and the ability of homeowners to pay what their obligations are. 
let, let, let's do this because we do have 45 minutes. Let me, let me say one other thing about this and then see if there are any questions on what we covered so far and then we'll, we'll continue. You know, essentially, there's a real asset, a home here. A mortgage is a claim on a real asset in an asset-backed uh, you know, asset security trust. Um, there are claims on a pool of basically real assets. This is once removed. It's a claim on a bunch of claims on some real assets. And this is claims on some claims on some claims on some real assets, which is why it's harder and harder, you know, this notion, we're getting to the second topic, that we'll just, you know, give relief to homeowners and their mortgages. We're a little bit beyond that with the notional amount being in these CDOs. So that's part of the problem of the simple yeah. solution we'll I, just relieve. Yeah. I just want to say one thing which I think is really important. This is not bad. All of what I've said is very, very good if everything is working well. And again, I want to draw the analogy of you buying a car. A car is a complicated piece of equipment. You do not typically look under the hood when you buy a car. As long as the guarantees behind that car are reasonable, as long as a, the AIGs and the credit agencies have done their job, then this is a very, very good thing because it spreads out the risk across a much larger community of possible investors. So the kinds of people that could be buying these securities could be investors in Egypt or in Iceland. They could be anywhere in the world. And this is kind of good because it spreads out the risk and it ultimately has a feedback effect to the homeowner in the sense that the homeowner is going to get a lower mortgage rate because that risk is dispersed through a wider net. You know, as an aside, there was a very good short uh, piece, op-ed piece by Thomas Friedman. You know, the financial market is the ultimate world is flat market you may want to take a look at because everything's done through the internet, through the computer, right? It's, there's, you're not moving physical goods around. Any questions at this point so far, Robin? It, you just might want to talk about subprime in this. So these asset-backed securities were made primarily the, uh, out of subprime mortgages. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. The, towards the end, towards 2006, 2007, you're taking all your riskiest mortgages and you're pooling those and you're tranching those. That's a, that's a very good point, Robin. You're tranching those pools. Uh, <laughs> if, if they weren't that risky, then they're probably being readily sold anyway. And so you don't have to get a AAA tranche created. But, but Peter, but when the securitization started, it was not for the subprime when it was done by Fannie Correct. Fannie and Freddie. Correct. Fannie and Freddie originally did not get into the subprime mor mortgage business. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, folks, before we uh, go on? Yeah. Uh, so, oh, okay. so after these uh, derivatives were being sold, they were still rated highly by the agencies? Some of the higher tranches were right. rated very highly. And of course, the lower tranches would provide phenomenal yields, maybe a thousand, uh, you know, 1,500 basis points spread because they were very, very risky. So what we're doing is we're creating tranches. Each of these tranches has a certain homogeneous exposure to risk. Some of them are almost riskless, and some of them are extremely riskless. So depending on your risk appetite, you can choose which tranche you want to own. Yeah, just pass that. But in the case of uh, the second level of CDOs, your triple A tranche is based on sub triple A tranches of the previous level. Uh, no, 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 no. no? It's, pr it's probably rated on Peter, triple you, B you tranches. That question for everybody? I'm not sure. So the question was, what we're doing in a, say, a CDO squared is we're taking triple B <coughs> CDOs, risky CDOs, and we're pooling them together, and they provide some set of cash flows. Then we're saying the first set of cash flows is going to go to a tranche. A lot of the cash flows we're not going to get, but the cash flows that we do get, the first set of them are going to go to this top tranche, and that tranche is going to be rated triple A. So it may have the whole portfolio backing them, $100 million backing them, but there's only 
$20 million in the top trash. They, they're getting all the cash flows from that $100 million. So 80 million of them have to default before this is really affected. Other questions? Yes. Well, we're coming to that. We haven't got there yet exactly what happened and what broke down in that supply chain. So all I've done at this point in time is I've sort of set up a supply chain, and then later I want to come and say, okay, what went wrong? How did that supply chain break? What were the weaknesses in the supply chain? And identify what, you know, what went wrong. Is that okay? Can I move on? Okay, now, uh, in the press you'll see reports that, uh, you know, derivative markets are really massive. And uh, they, are, they are massive if you look at their notional amount. I mean, the notional amount is $531 trillion. I mean, you can, you can paper the earth multiple, multiple times with dollar bills and still get never, nowhere close to $531 trillion. That's the notional amount. The actual exposure would be maybe less than 1%, less than half of 1% of that number. That would be sort of my guess. But inside that market is this credit default swap market, which really... But the, the, the reason you're saying that is many of them offset each other. Many of them offset each other. And yeah, there are reasons which I'll get to in a minute. But within that market is this credit default swap market which is a market for credit risk intermediation. So in, in May 2006, Alan Greenspan said that the credit default swap is probably the most important instrument in finance. And what he also said was what credit default swaps did was to lay off the risk of highly leveraged institutions. And that's what banks are, and we know they are. We've seen the data, right? They're highly leveraged on stable American, AIG, and international institutions. So what is a credit default swap? Let's look at KeyBank. It may or may not have made a lot of loans to General Motors. Okay, it may have lent money to General Motors, it may not have. But it's concerned that General Motors is going to default. Okay, so what it does is it enters into a contract where it pays a certain amount of money every quarter and it keeps on making those payments, in this case for five years. If nothing happens, it just will have made the payments for five years. But say in year three, General Motors defaults, then AIG will pay a fist load of money to key back. It's an insurance contract. So it's an insurance contract on General Motors. Right. And whether Key Bank has any interest in General Motors or not is irrelevant. They could or they may not. They may be pure speculators. They're speculating on General Motors dying. And if General Motors does die, then they, have, they get paid out. How much do they get paid out? Well, say the, general, the GM, when it defaults, the bondholders of General Motors get paid out two cents on the dollar. Then AIG will pay Key Bank 98 cents on the dollar. Okay, so that's called the loss rate. So they'll make, they'll make Key Bank good or whole. So to give you an example of this, there was a firm, Primus, which entered into, which sold insurance to a, a variety of counterparties on Lehman Brothers. And when Lehman defaulted, the recovery rate was 8.625 cents on the dollar. And so that meant the buyers of protection will get 91.375 cents on the dollar. And so since Primus had sold $80 million worth of insurance, Primus owned, owed uh, $73 million to its counterparties. Now Primus was uh, really good at doing this. They wrote uh, $16 million on WAMU. They wrote, they wrote $68 million on a bank in Iceland. 
they wrote 80 million on Lehman and 215 million on Fannie and Freddie. So they wrote a lot of insurance. And, and, this, was unregulated. and this is a completely unregulated market. So the notional amount in this case for on Fannie and Freddie would be that 215 million. They could have done it in the billions. There's no limit to how, how, how much they could have done it on. So if you look right now at General Motors, there's $1 trillion being placed on General Motors defaulting. $1, million of notion, $1 trillion of notional principal. And uh, the entire capitalization of General Motors is, a, I think it's about $6 billion. This 15 billion was a few weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> now, the credit default swap market, like any derivatives market, is kind of useful because through this market we get what's called price discovery. So, stock prices is, is informative, it tells you how well your company's doing. And the credit default swap market is also uh, useful because how much you pay for insurance, if you have to pay a lot for insurance, that obviously means the company's not very healthy. And so here is a time series of credit default swap rates on banking institutions. So this is very, very informative. This is why we have uh, clearing houses in markets is because they provide a forum for us where we actually learn about markets and this is good for society as a whole. So in terms of regulatory controls, which we'll talk about at our next meeting, having a regulated uh, credit default swap market makes enormous sense to me. The problems with, uh, w with this market or the, disadvan the, the advantages of it is it allows banks to diversify their credit risk. They've got, you know, Key Bank has got made too many loans to Eaton. They can, they can insure their Eaton risk so they don't have so much exposure. They can swap Eaton risk for someone else's risk. So they can easily reallocate credit risk in their portfolios and that's very important. The big disadvantage with any derivatives contract is that it creates adverse selection problems and moral hazard problems. Adverse selection means key bank is going to get rid of its bad loans. It's going to keep the bad credits, but it's going to insure them. And the other thing is moral hazard. They just keep lending to Eaton Corporation and then uh, hedging themselves by buying insurance even though they, they know that it's not a healthy loan. Okay, now this is really important. And it's really fun. <laughs> so think about making a risky loan to Eaton Corporation and buying credit protection on it. Well, that together what you've done is you've created a riskless bond, right? Now you don't care if Eaton collapses because you're going to get paid back in full. But put another way, you can create an Eaton bond by owning a riskless bond and selling Eaton risk. So a risky bond can be created synthetically by holding riskless bonds and selling insurance on Eaton. That's really important. Why is it important? Because what we'll do is we'll set up a sieve, and in the sieve, we'll sell credit default ins insurance on say 125 names, and we'll buy a lot of treasury bonds. What we've done is we've really created a, a portfolio of credit risks, synthetically. And we can tranche that out and create a CDO on those cash flows. So all of a sudden, we don't actually have to go out and lend money. We can create our own exposure to the existing loans that are out there. And this is called a synthetic CDO. And this is synthetic CDO market really uh, took off in the, last, uh, in the last decade. I think I'll skip a lot of these overheads because we're definitely going to run out of time. So if we go back to 
No, the size of the market I mentioned, it was, a, it, it was, a, it was bigger, much bigger than the subprime market. That's just to put it in context. It's $800 billion. Okay, so here's our supply chain. We've got our homeowners over here. We've got our securitization process going on here. Increasingly more complex credit risk, which is being distributed out and leveraged up on through these credit derivatives, which is a completely unregulated market. We've got banks like Citibank creating these serves, which owning these, uh, these, these, um, these products. So what, I've got about another 30 minutes? Okay, does this make sense? Is this story, uh, you're interested? You want to see the next session? Huh? You up for it? Okay, so we're going to advance to Act 7. In Act 7, the player that we're going to look at is actually what I think is a really, it's a small story, but it's a really compelling story. And it was the first bailout, and it was a private bailout. So let's look what happened. So Citigroup had set up one of these sieves, and in that sieve they dumped in a lot of asset-backed securities. These could have been CDOs, they could, they, they're basically all backed by sub-debt. And they sell commercial paper against, uh, to, to fund these asset-backed securities. Okay, so here we are, and these asset-backed securities suddenly aren't doing too well. So uh, that causes a little bit of problems for, 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 for the serve. And actually, this whole thing has got a backstop agreement by Citi. So if things go wrong, ultimately, uh, you know, Citi is the sugar daddy that has to come in. Because they're guaranteeing it or because they have the equity trench? Um, that's a good question. I, they're providing some backstop. If things get bad enough, there's a contingent backing. Yeah. So, so it's, an, it's, an, it's like an implicit guarantee like the U.S. government was acting in the same way for the agencies. I, it was more than, I, this is actually an explicit guarantee. So it's more than implicit. Okay, so uh, Citigroup thought, well, maybe we have to sell some of these bad, bad loans. But the problem is if they sold them, that would, have a market, that would have a price on the market value of all of these outstanding things. And on their own books, they have a whole lot of subprime debt. Now, at that time, Bank of America and JP Morgan also were carrying a whole lot of these uh, subprime mortgages. And they didn't want to see these mortgages uh, be written down. So they got together with Citi and created a slush fund which would prop up the prices of these asset-backed securities. So, of course, instead of calling it a slush fund to prop up <laughs> these activities, <laughs> they came up with a name, and the name is a Master Liquidity Enhancement Conduit, <laughs> which sounds very good. And this happened uh, over a year ago now, about a year ago. And it didn't work because the prices of these eventually uh, deteriorated to such a point that uh, Citi had to come in and put them back on their own balance sheet and take a massive write-off. So that's what I, I consider. It's a very, I think it's an important event in hindsight because it's an example of a <coughs> privately funded attempt to prop up prices against the deteriorating housing market. Here's a question. If the banks had these guarantees on these things, then why did they have the moral hazard problem? Because they did have skin in the game, right? That's kind of what. So, you know, I, I haven't researched very carefully the nature of these backstop agreements. And I think if there was an accountant in the room, we'd be able to better address that. But in order to get these off their balance sheet, they had to create a standalone corporation. And these were backstop agreements, which were explicit. But the moral, ha don't forget, 
they just bought, purchased these asset-backed securities way back. This, there's the whole supply chain that it came through. So the moral hazard issue of that has long been created, uh, uh, long in the past. I don't know, did I answer your question? Okay, so now we've set up the supply chain. I think now we can talk about what happens. And again, I'm not going to go through all of the things that are going to happen. I'm just going to hit the, the highlights. Lehman goes bankrupt. Again, hindsight, and this is my opinion, this is a big, big, big problem. Lehman, they allowed, the government allowed Lehman to go bankrupt because they wanted to set an example that not all banks are insured and there's not a safety net for everyone and you're going to be the role model of a bank that goes bust. But I think in hindsight, had they known the extent of the damage that this would do, they would have bailed out Lehman. That, that's my personal opinion. Now I'm going to try and not put too much of my personal opinion in this presentation. But one of the consequences uh, of it was that the three largest remaining investment banks soon became depository institutions. A default risk was, uh, um, it was exaggerated or uh, it increased dramatically. And an important counterparty was suddenly, suddenly gone. Uh, that together with AIG nearly collapsing raised concerns about the financial product insurance market. Okay, but what actually happened is it caused massive runs and some closures forcing asset liquidations and capital hoarding. So we'll look at reserve. Remember I said that these are money funds it's a 3.5 trillion market, and banks were increasingly important. Uh, they looked at these money funds for overnight funding, so they had become increasingly more important in our new financial markets. Reserve primary fund, I think Case could have been involved in, in investing in this fund, but reserve primary fund held $63 billion in assets, including $785 million in bonds issued by Lehman. That suddenly went under. Investors uh, actually lose money in this fund. It's the first time in a money market fund that people have lost money. Uh, it turns out that Reserve Primary Fund had no backstop agreement. There's no sugar daddy out there that would sort of bail them out. There were a lot of other funds that did have sugar daddies that came in and, and helped them. In fact, Bent, who was the, 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 I think, CEO of Reserve Primary Fund, just a few days before this problem, was quoted as saying, the purpose of a money fund is to bore the investors into a sound night's sleep. And all of a sudden, there's a massive run on this fund, and there was a lockout period of seven days, and people were losing money. Now let's see what this did to the supply chain. You've got all our money funds over here, and there's a run on the money fund. So what happens to this money fund is they stop buying commercial paper and they start hoarding funds. Why? Because they, they, they need to have that money available for, 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 for the people that, that want it. For redemptions. For redemptions. So this, co this causes problems uh, not only for the, obviously if no one's buying, what happens to interest rates? They must go, they must go up. And so the, in the commercial paper market, rates go up. And so that makes it expensive for General Electric, for Caterpillar, for all these good companies to go out and get money. Makes it more expensive. This is where Wall Street is really having a direct impact on Main Street. So there's a freeze up of this market. More Im equally important is these banks over here uh, couldn't get access to overnight funds. And this would become an increasingly more important source of funding for them rather than interbank lending. 
And the last thing they want to do now is lend money or borrow money from, uh, from one of their peer banks. So there's a flight to quality. Everyone is, uh, is running. In this case, it's very interesting because this is a United States credit crisis. And usually when there's a credit crisis, people flee the country. In this case, they flew to treasury rates, to treasury securities. And in fact, the yield on treasury securities goes negative. I mean, it's better to put your money under a pillow than to put it into a treasury. Credit, credit default swap rates increasing massively. Uh, overnight interbank rates are soar, soaring. And in fact, there's credit default swaps written against the United States Treasury. Think about it. You pay about 31 basis points a year to insure a United States Treasury security. I don't know who your counterparty would be. <laughs> but, but that's actually a lot cheaper than it was to insure, say, uh, against the euro. And here are what's happening to credit default swaps in different countries. And the United States is right over here. That 31 base, it went up to 31 basis points. This picture's a little old. 31 basis points, generally it had been very, very low. But just to put it in perspective, remember I said, uh, I said mortgage-backed securities or those pass-throughs around 2000 were trading at a 50 basis points. And here the credit default swap, insurance contracts on our own good old US uh, uh, securities are trading at 31 basis points. Lots of risk. I think in, in, in lieu of the time, I'm going to skip the commercial paper market, what happened in the commercial paper market. But the bottom line is banks are unwilling to, to, to they, they're hoarding cash at this moment. Okay, so we have what's called the vicious spiral. As firms have a difficult time borrowing, commercial paper rates are rising really dramatically, bank loans are unavailable. And many firms have what's called a revolving line of credit. That means they can get access, they've pre-negotiated access to these revolvers. They can get their hands on cash from their local bank. And the value of these promises are estimated at about $6 trillion. So this is a contingency. Remember, whenever you have a contingency, the way to think about it is it's a derivative. It's a derivative. It's a what if. And that's very important. So some firms are concerned that banks will be unable to maintain these promised loan facilities. I think uh, our university could have been one of them, where they tapped into uh, a, a, a revolver. And so these backup lines of credit are further hurting the banks, making money market funds even more scared. So they've got to hoard even more cash. Banks have to hoard even more cash because they're scared that these revolvers are going to be tapped. Here's the TED, TED spread. I think in the newspaper, it's in today's newspaper, you hear about the FAIR index, which is this VIX index. The VIX index is an important measure of FAIR in the economy. Here's another measure of FAIR. It's called the TED spread. And it's the spread between euro, dollar, or LIBOR rates and treasury rates. And it went skyrocketing as investors fled to safety. Okay, so let's see what the Fed does. Okay. The objectives of the Fed, as far as I can tell, is there's two real objectives of the Fed. The first is to keep liquidity at levels consistent with stable prices. To keep liquidity at levels consistent with stable prices. That's the first objective. The second objective is to provide liquidity to keep, it, to keep bank systems afloat. So what did they do? They poured hundreds of billions of dollars into the system, lowering the Fed funds rate. The Fed funds rate is the basically 
the rate you can borrow from the Federal Reserve Bank, the banker of bankers, had absolutely little effect. Banks just hoarded more and more cash. Typically, excess, retur excess reserves at the Federal Reserve Bank is about $2 billion, and it just scored, soared to about $190 billion. So banks are just hoarding cash for all the purposes that we just talked about. Okay, so here's what the Fed did. They had to stop the run on money funds. They absolutely had to do that. So they went out and they said, we'll guarantee all money market funds. Don't go run on, your, on, 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 on a money fund. Your money's safe. They've never done anything like that in the history of the world. In fact, they don't even insure deposit accounts. So our deposit accounts only have $100,000 protection. Here yeah, they've given a blanket insurance to money funds. That's the first thing they did. The second thing they did, which to me at the time was a little weird, is they stopped abnormal speculation on financial stocks by hedge funds. So they thought, and maybe they had some information that I'm unaware of, but they thought that by restricting short sales, short sales means that you're betting that a stock price will drop, by banning those bets, they thought that would be a good thing. Again, in my opinion, I think that it just exacerbated fear because this was a highly unusual step to have taken. The third thing they did is they stopped the migration of hedge fund money out of surviving investment banks. So at that time, these investment banks were, were going down the tube and people, hedge funds were moving their money out of these hedge funds, uh, out of these investment banks. So they just converted the surviving ones, Morgan Stanley and Goldman, they converted them to banks. And then they, uh, they had to support housing prices, so they, pro they proposed a first bailout plan. So those are the four steps that they, they, they did. Sorry, there was a fifth step. They didn't want the government to do all the work. And so they allowed private equity to take up an ownership position, a bigger ownership position in banks. Okay, they, didn't, they didn't allow Walmart to own a bank, but they certainly allowed um, private equity to take up bigger stakes in banks. A little later, they came in and said, deposit accounts, uh, we can change, uh, upgrade that insurance, uh, the deposit insurance to 250000 Okay, we're running out of time, so uh, let me just very briefly comment on Fannie and Freddie. Again, if you look at the credit default swap market, you can see that over time, the riskiness of Fannie and Freddie was well recognized by the market with increasing credit spreads. In fact, back in April 2005, Alan Greenspan had hinted that there were massive problems with Fannie and Freddie. In fact, he said it might not be enough to just create a single regulator for the companies which hold more than 45% of the mortgage loans in this country. Somehow we need more competition between them. World-class regulation by itself may not be sufficient. This was back in April 2005. Various commentators had uh, talked about the massive amount of leverage that had gone on in Fannie Mae and the lowering of standards in Fannie Mae. So there are reports that the real adjusted leverage number was a number, a ludicrous number, like 78 to 1. Okay, so um, basically uh, Fannie and Freddie uh, did, um, they were taken over and uh, actually, in recent times, they've done a good job. Their balance sheet has actually been expanded a little bit as the private labels have essentially shut down completely. So banks like National City and Key Bank that were holding a lot of pipeline risk, that they, they're in the process of securitizing their loans, they've left with a whole lot of loans, uh, Fannie Mae actually came to their rescue in some sense and now as you can see in 2008, 
uh, they've taken over quite, quite a lot of, of the business. So we're now in a cycle where um, deleveraging has, has started and uh, that's going to continue for some time. Again, I think in the interests of time, uh, I'll skip through this. Maybe we should start wrapping up. Let me very briefly comment uh, on the investment banks. Uh, there's some things that are going on investment banks that are very good. And there's some things that are going on investment banks that I think will probably die out or are very bad. So the things that are working well and probably will continue to work well are things like uh, the advisory work and mergers and acquisitions, underwriting, wealth management, investment management. Uh, those are things that are still probably uh, going to survive and survive well. The things that are a little bit more up in the air are the structured products and derivative markets. They're a little stuck at the moment. Volume of these contracts have dramatically been reduced. Uh, trading activities, you need a very leveraged desk in order to make profit margins. Uh, this is not uh, happening right now. And prime brokerage, these are areas of concern because security lending has been affected. and. Uh, that's an activity which will probably uh, come, under, w w come under massive change. Let me end up with just a comment on global markets. Uh, you know, there's a ripple effect. This is not just a United States crisis anymore. It's a worldwide wide crisis. Uh, if you look at, the, uh, <laughs> at Iceland, they ended up nationalizing three of its, national, of its major banks. They shut down the stock exchange. They've halted trading, uh, trading in its currency. And they $60 billion in debt. They had uh, much larger debt than their GDP. And in fact, just I think it was yesterday, there was a $6 billion bailout by the IMF. Uh, to put that in perspective, there's only 320,000 people on that island, and so that's basically $19,000 a person. This is, uh, and this disease is spreading from the Wa Washington Post uh, a few days ago. They, there's a great article, very pessimistic article, about how this disease is spreading to countries like U uh, Hungary and Ukraine. Uh, he has a quote from Ukraine. Uh, uh, Ukraine, whose central bank governor declared his banking system normal and reliable on Monday of last week. By Tuesday, Ukraine had desperately requested systemic support from the IMF. So there's lots of countries out there that are really in financial uh, trouble. Uh, most re recently, I think Pakistan, which has got 25% inflation and is in really bad shape. So, so what I, I think we've done today is um, we have, uh, let's see, we've set up the supply chain. So we sort of know how things work, where it got broken, the ripple effects through the supply chain. We know what the problems are. And I think at our next session, we will have a genuine roundtable discussion. And we'll start pointing fingers and asking the questions of, you know, what went wrong? Is it the homeowners that should that take on a lot more responsibility? Is it the structure of the loans that were wrong? Who should be bearing interest rate risk? What's wrong with the 30-year fixed rate mortgages? We'll look at mortgage brokers, the compensation mechanisms that mortgage brokers have and the incentives they have. We'll look at the securitization process again. Maybe there's something wrong in that process. The role of rating agencies. We'll look at credit default swaps. We looked at them a little bit today and see what went wrong. Maybe this is a market that requires more regulation, maybe not. We'll look at what is the role of an exchange in terms of price discovery, clearing houses, showing us more information of the inventory of different entities. 
We'll look at the, perhaps uh, the solution is to consolidate some of the regulatory agencies. And actually, we haven't looked at the exact ter terms of the bailout plan. So we'll look at the bailout plan and see what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. We'll look at globalization issues. Clearly, the world has become a very small place. And when the world has become so small, and it's so interdependent, and with it has come the notion of complexity. And when you talk about complexity theory, there's two types of complexity. There's good complexity, and there's bad complexity. So we have to understand what is good complexity and what is bad complexity. But just to give you a heads up on that, when you think of a of baking a cake, right? You've got step one, you get the ingredients. Step two, you start mixing the ingredients one at a time until eventually you have a cake. But if you mess up along any one of those steps, the cake goes bad. That's an example of bad complexity. And if in our financial systems we have bad complexity, that can lead to all kinds of problems. So regulation, if it exists, should exist to sort of reduce bad complexity or systemic risk. So I think that's where we are. There are some issues about the structure of investment banks, the fact that many of them were private entities that went public, and was this a good thing or a bad thing? We can talk about that. So hopefully at our, at our next session, you know, I almost feel apologetic that this was a sort of a tutorial rather than a real roundtable discussion. But uh, we thought it was important just to set the players up so that in our next meeting we can have a genuine roundtable discussion of some of the issues that are facing us. Does that make sense? Let me, uh, let me ask everybody a question or, or, or so. This time seemed to work pretty well for everybody. Um, you're not going to offend us if very few hands go up. And how many of you think coming to a second session that's a roundtable session uh, would be a worthwhile endeavor? How many of you would be here for the second session? Good. Okay, so we'll probably do it around this time next week. We're also going to do two other things. We will put up on a uh, probably a, uh, a normal access restricted website some of these articles that people may want to see. If you haven't seen that New York Times thing, et cetera, I think that uh, would be good. We'll keep it relatively simple. That's one thing uh, we'll do. Uh, the other thing I'd encourage you to do is if you have some particular topics or questions that you want us to address in the next session, you know, shoot one of us an email or just drop by and let us know what you want to talk, ab to talk about. Before we uh, part, any questions that folks have today? Appreciate you giving us all your time. Rest of the silent panelists, anything you want to add? We'll hear from everybody. Okay, thanks to Peter for putting this together. Thank you.